so my name is uh, Jonathan, and I work uh, as a developer at Klarna and have been for roughly four years now with a short detour as a development manager. Now I'm back again uh, in one of the Erlang core teams. And most recently, I've been involved in this project here we call Steve, together with uh, Masse, if you saw the last talk in here. He's the lead architect of this, and I'm his sort of uh, errand boy, sort of, and uh, yeah, doing these kind of promotions. Um, so Steve is short for, I think, at least uh, system test and verification environment, some sassy thing like that. But uh, what it's really about is trying to tackle the system testing challenges that we're facing at Klarna. And uh, initially it will be mostly geared toward performance testing, but hopefully as it matures it may also be used for functional testing, I guess. Um, so uh, I think I will start off by giving you a bit of a background to uh, Klarna, sort of. Uh, if you've been to other Klarna talks, you might have heard parts of this before, uh, but I think it's uh, a, ni a nice thing to get some sort of background, sort of where are we coming from. I will, of course, also describe uh, what we're trying to achieve with Steve and what we're trying to do, and hopefully we'll have some time for a little demonstration of a couple of tools we're we are open sourcing uh, to the community. Um, so we'll see uh, exactly how much time we've left, uh, what I'll show. Um, so uh, Klarna, we are actually hiring. So if you're interested in Klarna, you can go to this fancy blog we are apparently are uh, having. Um, so if you don't know anything about Klarna, we're a financial company within the payments industry. So we shuffle, mm, shovel money around uh, all over Europe. Pretty nice. So uh, if you went to Massa's presentation, you can see I have much more fancy pictures uh, than he has. So when I started at Klarna, this was, as I said, four years ago. Um, in essence, there was one system doing it all, um, one system that mattered at least, and this system was called CRED. Uh, CRED was and is still today uh, quite the monolith. Uh, it has its roots, I think, in some prototype Klack uh, and TLF guys built in three months or something to get the company started. Um, and when I started, I think it consisted of somewhere around maybe four to six Erlang applications, roughly. Uh, and these applications did uh, everything at Klarna. They handled purchase requests from merchants, they handled dunning chains, they handled bookkeeping, they even served web pages for uh, our merchants and for uh, our customer service agents. You know, it was pretty nasty. So, you know, at that time we were also around maybe 30 developers. We were working this monolithic, highly coupled code base, trying to constantly uh, add and enhance functionality, maintain existing functionality, as well as, you know, expand into new markets. Um, so we were uh, running pretty fast to try to keep up with the business's demands, and, uh, you know, the system wasn't really built with testing in mind, uh, and testing was, sad to say, pretty low on the priority list. Uh, not that we didn't do testing, of course we did testing, but the, the tooling around it was pretty poor, and uh, this especially from a system test perspective. Black box testing, for instance, was non-existing at this point. <coughs> so as the business was growing in transaction volume, uh, it became pretty clear, uh, even back then, that the current architecture would not, probably not, uh, going to withstand year-over-year -year exponential growth that we pretty much still is seeing. And, you know, this won't go on forever. And they combine that with the fact that we were also cramming more and more developers into an uh, already crammed code base. So you can see this is probably not a good idea. So the work uh, to break up this nice little monster here uh, was initiated uh, a couple of years back. Um, I think last year at EUC, uh, a colleague of mine, Daniel Lee, gave a talk on the work we did to break up this monolith and how we did it. Uh, just a short recap of that. Um, so since uh, all this functionality we had in this old system, CRED was pretty arcane, 
Klarna didn't, of course, want to force new APIs on its customers, nor did we want to change the behavior of our existing APIs. Uh, we chose a pretty, um, how should I say, conservative uh, migration approach. Um, so um, this little stone hand here is, uh, s symbolizes the new system thread then, which instead of being a monolith, um, it's more like a, it's basically a cluster of React nodes with some functionality on top. So the intention was to break out all the front-end functionality from uh, the monolith. So by front-end, I mean all calls basically terminating purchases. So we wanted to lift this out and uh, do this in a safe way. So, you know, uh, decouple application and wiring all the spaghetti. Um, and uh, then move the necessary applications to the new platform. Uh, and since we didn't have a really sophisticated uh, system testing uh, infrastructure in place, we sort of have had to move, uh, <laughs> you know, keep code in both platforms. So we moved applications to the, to, to the new system. Uh, some of the frameworks built for the new systems was ported back into the old system and you know, run the code uh, momentarily on the old system as well, and then start routing up uh, traffic. Uh, and uh, I mean, in one sense, maybe not literally, but at least we split the system in half. So we have one half uh, handling the, the front-end traffic and one system uh, handling all the back-office functionality. These systems uh, still communicate today with each other in various ways. But the idea here, here is that if the back office goes down, the front end can still be up and, and, and take purchases. Um, and uh, of course, it's not just this system. Other systems are also coming up, like, um, you know, um, for doing uh, credit assessments. Uh, maybe we have a third party solution for that. And, uh, all different kinds of systems are popping up, and uh, this second system is actually also becoming obsolete uh, since our third platform is already under development. So this is the new fancy um, enterprise service-oriented uh, architecture uh, kind of thingy. And so the intention here is to take new markets with this new platform and then uh, migrate existing markets to this new platform as well. So that means that some things will have to be replaced by third-party components. Some things will probably be broken out and serviceified as standalone services. And other things will maybe be rewritten. I don't know uh, what the future holds there. But one thing I can say is that uh, the lack of external black box-minded tests uh, makes this kind of migration work uh, much slower than it really needs to be. So from my point of view, it's very clear that we could benefit here from some sort of at least semi-automatic way of testing the integrity of the system. Um, and uh, a point I want to drive here is that uh, um, you really want to keep the tests separate from the, from the code base of the, of the system because um, that makes it much easier to sort of actually test the new system and see that it actually behaves as the old system. So certainly if you're observant so far, I've mostly covered and talked about the lacking tests for functional requirements of the system, right? And historically, I think this has made a lot of sense because the kind of loads we have been seeing before in history maybe aren't... Uh, uh, that big, not that they have been small, and it's definitely uh, increasing, but um, it, it probably hasn't been the biggest challenge uh, for us, I think. But uh, this is changing, so as we are expanding into new markets, as well as continuing to grow in the existing ones, uh, we continue to see more and more load coming into our systems. And this requires us to be much more aware of uh, you know, where we are at from a non-functional perspective. Um, now, a problem is that uh, introducing performance testing in such a late stage of a company when you already have a lot of systems and more systems popping up, it's proven to be quite hard. You know? So it's much harder to do this um, late 
than it is to do it early. So I would suggest to do this from day one. Make sure that you have a proper system test infrastructure up and running you know, from day one, because it might take some time, but it's nowhere near the time it takes to do it uh, after the fact. And also, uh, of course, uh, changes to, to the system cannot, you know, it's hard to, um, to notice if you introduce really severe bugs. So um, I know Happy mentioned um, uh, in his talk, Eric Stelman, if you went to his talk yesterday, he mentioned that little nice feature in uh, Erlang R15 that was introduced which is um, uh, a way for you to actually see what line number, in the stack trace you can see the line number of where, where, you know, in, where in the code a crash occurs, for instance. Uh, and this uh, seems like a pretty non-dangerous feature for anyone. Um, it only so happens that uh, one of those frameworks, I was talking about we were porting some of the frameworks from the new system to the old system, right? to make sure that both code could live in both systems. So one of these frameworks had a little nice feature um, that it caught every exception that it, that it got, basically, and it didn't know what to do with it, so it called it get stack trace. And it so happens that uh, we didn't do this once or twice. We did this like, I don't know, what did you say, Eric? 50,000 times a second or something? Ish. Um, so, I mean, we, after we went to R15, we started seeing some problems and uh, the system wasn't really behaving that well. And uh, I did some instrumentation on this and, uh, you know, uh, the garbage collection was just insane. We spent like 30% in garbage collection, uh, garbing about like 100 megs of, of, of RAM every call, you know, so something was up. And eventually we found, found the bug, of course. and. Uh, if we had had more automatic way of, of discovering these things, it wouldn't have happened. So I'm not saying that we're not doing any performance testing at all, uh, uh, or haven't, we have always done that, but uh, in my opinion, they have been a bit lacking, and um, so I don't know, I don't wanna go too much into the details here, but basically, um, you had sort of a setup where you, you, you stood here as the system on the test, you set it up in a, in a particular state, uh, and then you replayed logs from the, from, from, from the live logs onto uh, the system and see how it behaved. And then you could use maybe a different code or something to test this. But uh, this setup had a few problems. One, of course, is that uh, you don't want to deal with personal data because that is a very sensitive matter. So either you have to be extremely, extremely uh, tight about, about uh, locking this environment down, or you have to anonymize the data, which is also you know, quite tricky. So uh, to do this, we had to do pretty time-consuming setups. And um, if we wanted to run traffic at a higher rate than the original load, then we had to sort of compress the traffic and then run it. And this was, of course, especially problematic if uh, you have multiple core calls that has to come in in a particular order and those you know, kind of things. Um, so it was pretty hard to get reliable results. Um, it was nearly impossible to reproduce uh, test scenarios uh, in a timely manner, and so forth. Um, so um, we know something has to be done about these things, right? Moral of the story, we need more sophisticated non-functional tests in order to find and fix bottlenecks and bugs more preem preemptively. Uh, they need to be easy to run and automate and so forth. So, uh, yeah, now how many testers are in here? One, two, okay, I'm not a tester, so. But for the rest of you then, uh, just so we know what we want to do here, yeah, I don't know. Um, there, there are slight differences between these uh, different uh, things here. So the testers might want to correct me here if I'm incorrect, but to my understanding, performance test is uh, perhaps a bit more manual process where you sort of gradually want to increase load to a system. Uh, you want to look for bottlenecks and you know, measure um, you know, 
find measurements and yeah, benchmark the system basically. Whereas load test is more of a procedure where you figure out how the system is behaving under a predefined level of load. So for instance, you want to see, okay, the maximum amount of the load uh, the system can handle, how much is that? And for how long can it handle it? Or something, something of the sorts. Uh, stress test is more determining at what level of load the system cannot cope anymore. When does it break down? How does it break down? Um, and so forth. Was this fairly correct? Disagree? I disagree, but performance testing is you have a performance requirement so yeah. to make sure it works. So okay. Load testing is you try to find the errors which only appear when the load is high. Stress testing is you crash the system and you want to be sure that it degrades to a safe state in a normal, in a nice way so that you can actually restart it again. Yeah, so sounds like complementary uh, definitions then. Yeah. Yeah. But anyways, um, we have testers at Klarna also who know this uh, better, and uh, <laughs> I'm sure Masse can add some to it. Anyway, so uh, we started this fantastic project, Steve, and uh, we had a little wish list, I guess, and Masse, you can add to this if you want to, but um, I mean, one thing, I talked about it already, we wanted the scenarios to be external in order to, you know, ha to be able to disregard from the implementation of the system. Um, uh, and uh, we wanted the test to be uh, completely black box. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, the monitoring, of course, has to consider the system in a white box manner because how else are you going to instrument the system? We wanted to use synthetic data uh, to get around all this uh, nasty business with dealing with privacy concerns. Um, we wanted the results to be highly reproducible. And we wanted to run the system on the test with a uh, live configuration, basically. So no, no test data, no, no test configuration in any, in any manner, basically. Um, yes, so I hope, I hope we will accomplish this. And to some extent, we already have. So um, this is just a little bird view of it. Um, really meaningless slide in one sense. So on this level, you can basically see Steve as uh, a software stack for pushing data into our system on the test. And um, um, uh, all, what I want to emphasize here again is that um, the software testing we're doing is completely separated from the system we are actually testing here. So I have a little bit more of an executive summary here of it. <coughs> and I'm going to run through exactly what we're doing here. Um, so if you look here, we have the system on the test and we have the synthetic internet. In one aspect, this is actually external to Steve because the system on the test could be, we want it to be able to be any setup really because we have multiple, multiple different systems that we want to test uh, in different configurations maybe. Uh, and we want to be able to reuse our software testing component for all these different systems. So uh, you could, for instance, choose to deploy your system on full-blown ex uh, replicas of the, of the system hardware, for instance. You can uh, deploy a single node system on a developer laptop and run some tests. Um, and in our sort of live-like setup, we are configuring it so that the system under test is guarded by a firewall that is configured exactly as the live firewall. Um, we have a synthetic internet uh, here that blocks any outgoing traffic from all of these components to make sure we don't actually, by mistake, start sending emails to left and right or sending text messages or, or what have you. Uh, so... Um, Another thing we're doing here is that we have a fake DNS in the synthetic internet. So um, let's say that the system on the test want to do a credit lookup, for instance. Uh, it might want to try to contact the Swedish provider CreditSafe or something of the sorts. We actually hijack that DNS and, and routes it to one of our external mocks that you can see there. So 
uh, from the system point of view, it's actually a live system. And um, yeah, that's um, pretty nice. So we know we're, we're actually testing the real thing here. So deploy it as live and keep it as live-like as you possibly can. Um, so uh, if we then go to the coordinator then, we call this the spider. Uh, and it's really, literally, it's the spider in this whole thingy here. It has a set of API drivers that are pluggable. So uh, for every API you want to test, you need to have an API driver so that the coordinator know how to actually talk to the system you are trying to test or the API you're trying to test here. So uh, the coordinator sort of takes, we, we, we take a sort of a, what should we call it, a declarative approach here. So um, the coordinator declares, uh, defines a set of high, really high level uh, scenarios that you can run. So for instance, we have a product called uh, Klarna Checkout. Uh, it's a pretty fancy thing. Um, and uh, let's say we want to test a successful purchase in Sweden on the checkout, for instance. That's a very high level. So you get the idea that we, we try to, you know, not be too detailed on this, uh, on this high level. And uh, the coordinator also knows how to generate the synthetic da data that it needs. So in essence, you can say that the coordinator knows how to transform the high level scenarios that we define into actual traffic that gets sent to the system. It knows what API drivers to trigger and in what order and with what data. And the coordinator then only talks to the system on the test through its APIs. No specific configuration that differentiates from a live system in, in, in this case. And uh, yeah, the load generator, yeah, it's only concerned about generating different load patterns, uh, be it constant bursts or maybe a, a model of live traffic somehow. Uh, we also have a little mirror there uh, of the state of the system. So, um, so the coordinator knows roughly at least what data is in the system. So we know about all the consumers and what different depths they have towards us and, and so forth. Um, so what's next? Any questions on this so far? You're smiling? Looks pretty. Doesn't it? So the data generation, of course, you know, you need to generate all required data points for a specific scenario. And as I said before, we wanted tests to be reproducible somehow. We wanted to be able to uh, maybe run the same test twice with different uh, configurations or, or something of the sorts. So this data generation is sequence-based, meaning that we have a sequence number. And from this sequence number, we generate a hash and procedurally generate the data that is going to be sent to the system. So give the coordinator the same sequence number and you will end up with the same data. So you can, of course, randomize data then by randomizing what sequence number you're sending, generate the hash, and then there you go. You have, um, you have uh, data. So I think that's a pretty brilliant approach. Um, All right. So um, I think I'll go ahead and go to let's see what time do we have? Yes. So um, for load generation, we are uh, using a little tool that uh, we've actually built in the house. Uh, it's called Ponos. It's named after the Greek god of uh, hard labor and toil. And my Russian colleagues. Uh, informed me that uh, this word apparently means diarrhea in uh, Russian. Um, and I figured that, yeah, <laughs> well, makes sense. So let's keep it. Um, so, uh, I mean, this is, this, this, I guess it started more of like a toy, you know. We wanted something that um, had a minimal configuration that was easy to work with, no external dependencies, 
you know, it, it had to be concerned about load patterns only. That's the only thing we wanted to do with it. We wanted the load patterns to be flexible. So we didn't only want to say, ah, I want 10 calls per second or 100 calls per second. I wanted to say, I want, uh, okay, 10 calls per second. Then I want bursts of 20 calls per second every 20 seconds or something. And I want uh, a sawtooth. I want, you know, whatever kind of load pattern you, you, you want, really. Um, and, um, you know, the obvious question is, of course, uh, why would you roll your own? There are a lot of other good load generators out there, and uh, indeed there is. And uh, so we've, we have sort of built it in a way so that we can actually replace this Ponos load generator if we want to, if we see the need for it. But um, it's turned out to be quite useful, actually. We, we, we used to use a lot of Basher Bench within uh, Klarna before. I don't know how many have used Basher Bench. Okay, a few people. So it was a bit, um, I don't know, it, 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 um, it's also pretty easy to get started and it's uh, accessible and so forth, but uh, I don't know, we found, you know, it has a whole bunch of external dependencies on everything from Cassandra to I don't know what. So half the uh, Erlang open source uh, contribution is in there. Uh, bit exaggeration, of course, but uh, and also we didn't, uh, at least to my understanding, the load patterns that you can produce are not that flexible. You can basically say that you want uh, X amount of workers and they are supposed to operate at a certain amount of calls per second, um, and that's pretty much what you have. Um, so we just uh, wanted something that was really super easy to work with, and uh, um, so um, that's why we did it. I, I thought I should uh, just do a short demo of it to show you a bit what you can do. We're open source and it, it's not on GitHub yet, but it will be um, shortly, I hope. Uh, let's see now. How do I get here? I need. All right, can we see this? Is it do large enough for you? Let's just make sure we have a build. All right. So um, currently we only have a command line or only. I mean, what else do you need? Uh, a command line interface for this uh, little beauty. Um, and um, Ponos has uh, only one important concept, really, and that is load generators. Uh, load generators has a few things to them, not that much. So, for instance, we have a name. Uh, this could be pretty much anything. In this case, it's the con uh, atom constant. All right. So what else do we need? We need some work to be performed. And this is a list of functions. So let's just do a function that returns OK. Nothing too uh, tricky here. All right. So what else do we need? We need something that we call a load specification here. Um, and this is what we wanted to make uh, flexible. So I guess this is, this is the interesting part here. Um, and what, what a load spec is, is really just a function of time. So instead of saying I want 10 calls per second, I say here is a function that takes the time in, um, I think, in milliseconds since uh, uh, the load generator started, and then it returns the current load. Yes? No. Oh, another question, okay. Um, so for instance, if I wanted to make a constant load, I could actually just do this and I would get, just disregard the time and always give me 10 calls per second. Now we do have some, uh, so far, a few predefined load patterns that you can use. Um, let's do, it's in Pono's load specs. Uh, let's see. So we have uh, currently implemented uh, burst, triangle, constant, sawtooth and staircase functions. Um, and I mean, this list could grow indefinitely. And I mean, I think the most interesting thing here would be to actually um, be able to analyze a load pattern 
uh, from your live traffic and actually, you know, make sure you create a function that, uh, that corresponds to that pattern. Uh, another feature here that I want to implement is the ability to, uh, I don't know, maybe not combine them maybe, but at least do some um, operations on these uh, load patterns as well. So maybe you could multiply a pattern by two. So you have analyzed your pattern. This is how my traffic looks. What happened if uh, this pattern grows to two or something? So, not sure how useful it is, but I think it's pretty cool. So let's just do the simple thing here and add uh, some constant load. Let's say five calls per second, something small, okay? Right, there are other options you can add, but so a simple load generator is, this is just all you need. So you need a name, so the, a name, you need a list of tasks, tasks, and you need uh, a load spec. All right, pretty straightforward. So let's go ahead and add this uh, load generator to Can you see this? It's a bit too long now. Oh. <sighs> Ponos colon add load generator. So this takes a list of load generators. So you can add several ones, uh, several ones at once. Whoops. Okay, now my my Tmax session is acting up. Five, right? So this looks better, right? All right, so this is basically the same thing. Now, let's pray to the gods. All right, so that's pretty much it. So what do we have now? There are some rudimentary things you can do to expect this. So uh, here we can see that it's actually running at uh, 4.9975012. Uh, calls per second. So this works actually by sampling this uh, this uh, load specification function. Um, so um, I don't know. Let's add something else here. We can add um, just to show. Uh, so the name can actually be anything. Uh, we can have, let's say, tasks. This is pretty nice as well. You will recognize it from Bashabench if you used it. So uh, we can have uh, one function that returns low. And then we do this. This one returns mic. And I put a two there. So you can actually make these tasks uh, weighted as well. So what this means that uh, the function that returns mic will, on average, get uh, 66 percent of, uh, of, of the triggered calls, and uh, the function that returns low will get uh, the rest of the 33 percent. So I na name tasks, and we have some load spec here as well. Let's call it, uh, let's do, I think make some bursts. So every 10 seconds, um, for 10 seconds I want zero load, for 10 seconds I want, let's say, mm, 10 calls per second, all right? And then we create um, this little thing here, name, tasks, load spec. All right, and now we get, you can see Burster is currently operating at 0, 0.0. See, has it passed 10 seconds? Yes, there we go. So there you have 
The model load is then basically that you can see here is um, what are we expecting? What kind of load uh, does the load specifications actually dictate? Um, and now we're back to zero there. And so on and on it goes. And so where are we on time? Yeah, we have 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. So uh, another little thing then, you can also, I mean, of course, this is uh, all nice and so, but um, there is another thing you can do. You can actually, so all things that happen within Ponos uh, triggers events, right? So when a load generator starts, when it finishes, uh, you can set the duration for, the, for a load generator. Uh, so when it finishes, when it starts, uh, when it triggers the task, and uh, when it completes the task, and so forth. So these events you can actually listen to through an event manager. So there is, um, we call these ones little babies collectors. There is a raw collector that you can use that basically just dumps the events to file. So let's call it uh, the EUC log. This should be a string. All right. Uh, so we can actually see that currently it's only the constant function running OK right now. And soon we will see the bursts coming in here. Right. You see, some are doing mic, some are doing hello. And this is. Uh, this sort of uh, thing is pretty handy. Uh, Cons, another colleague of mine, is actually working on a regulator for, for, for through this uh, event handler. So uh, you could actually then see. So OK, maybe we should just hang on here. So what you see here, task run. So uh, you get the name of the, of the um, uh, load the generator. You get the time it took, as reported by, by uh, timer TC, and you get the end result here also. So uh, you could actually make sure that your, the tasks that you're running are returning other kinds of metrics that you want to, that you want to log. Um, so in Consul's case, he is sort of uh, writing a, a load specification that I think utilizes this to see how, what is the system actually responding. Uh, and as long as everything is fine, he just keeps increasing the load. And once uh, the load, uh, once the system starts uh, returning errors or timeouts or something like that, you decrease the load again. So um, yeah, this will be coming up on GitHub, um, short, shortish. So I think we're sort of uh, running out of time. Uh, okay. We so, oops. So, questions? Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks. Cool stuff. I really liked it. The simplicity is, is really nice. So, if you do this load testing thing, how do we as users add extra load specs? Because the load spec is kind of the the strategy of how to put the load on there. Is it simple to write those load specs or? Yeah, I mean, so, so it's just, it's just, um, just an RT1 function and uh, Ponos will pass the, the time passed in milliseconds since the load generator started. And uh, I mean, I can show you some of the current ones, uh, how they look. They might need some cleaning up here, but um, so here is an example from how to make the bursts. Um, and below you see the constant one, it just disregards the time. So, so it's pretty straightforward how to do this. Then of course, if you want to make a really complex pattern, the, yeah, the implementation will be more complex. So, were you planning, or are you planning to do some kind of uh, generation of the responsiveness from the external mocks, from the external service? Uh, so, if we are planning to uh, to do what exactly? To so yeah, so you can generate the load on your system and see yes. how it behaves. Yes. However, you're 
you're you're doing the mocks for external system mm -hmm. misbehavior or, or behavior, right? Mm -hmm. But what what if they misbehave, start taking too long to respond, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Are you cons concerned? Yeah, then we're with having problems. Well, we're actually we ran into one of these issues. Uh, one of the components uh, was uh, actually so we ran a lot of traffic against the system, and we realized that uh, something is off here, and it turned out to be one of the. Uh, components. So the so question is, do you plan to model those as well as part of this this coordinator? Uh, you know that it can uh, tell. So, so you mean if you can configure them to behave in a certain specific yeah. way? Well, exactly. Uh, like you, I know, one percent of the calls takes you know one second, and the rest takes hundred. Uh, currently, we don't have that support, but uh, why not? It's a great idea, actually. So because. Um, uh, that is also, of course, an interesting aspect of being able to mock these systems that you can actually see how our system behaves if that one starts misbehaving. So, Do I got the concept correctly that because you're transitioning to you know, a service-oriented architecture, like more breakdown, so the system under test could actually be any small component of your system, and then external mocks will be other services? Yeah, so, yeah I mean, you see, so, so that, that, that's so why, what I think is beauty, beautiful about this setup, is that Steve is sort of completely ignorant about what system it's testing. It cares about what APIs we're testing and how they are configured. Uh, from our point of view, we don't really care, actually. Well, we care that the APIs are there, but... I have a question about these um, tasks, the mm -hmm. funds you mm -hmm. showed were quite simple. How, how would you simulate if you want to do a sequence of signals, for example, and you, you need to save state between the signals you send? Um, yeah, well, I mean, then you would have to implement that yourself. So, I mean, we could, of course, you, you mean if we, if, we, if we could thread some state through the different calls or? Uh, yes. Don't you need that for your own testing? Or is every task independent of each yeah, other? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the way we have chosen to build it is that we only have the high level uh, scenarios defined in, in, the, in, the, in the coordinator, basically. So from, from um, uh, the load generator's point of view, it doesn't care. But I can definitely see that uh, you would have a need of uh, threading state through uh, the different tasks, of course. Um, but it's also hard, I mean, since, I mean, currently you don't, um, what we also need to implement here is, of course, a way to make, uh, because uh, uh, the load generators are completely asynchronous. It only, it only guarantees that you will have a, um, a certain load triggered, you know, it's a calls per second, but, it, but, but, but you don't, you don't have a way of saying, as you can do in Basher Bunch, for instance, that you can say, I want 10 workers, and I want them to um, work at a certain uh, speed, but don't send another request until the last one returns, for instance. So currently, that th what you're suggesting wouldn't make much sense because you know, all the tasks are considered to be independent. So if you see what I mean, that they are sort of completely asynchronous, so it just triggers off these tasks and... Um, I think in many systems, the, the, the sort of thing you're simulating could be emulated with some kind of state machine. So the, your fund would typically send a message to a process that is simulating this state machine, and he mm -hmm. would do the next state transition. Mm -hmm. Then he could li live for a long while, and then you sort of, you could simulate a million mobile phones, for example, like mm -hmm. we do. <laughs> Yeah. It looks great, this. Mm. Sweet. Anything else? Yeah. Anybody? Yeah, if you don't have any questions, then thank you for the presentation. Thank you.